Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta, and in Butte, Montana, or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, we want to thank Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. While you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping Your First Three Years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsors this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a new quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinator insects, both wild and managed, before they disappear. The magazine is full of beautiful photos and informative articles. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. And speaking of Kirsten, she's with us today with another fascinating interview of the women of beekeeping world. Welcome, Kirsten. Hi, Jeff. So good to be speaking with you again today. Well, it's great to have you back. Good to have you back, Kirsten. Thank you. I always love chatting bees. <laughs> <laughs> well... So we've got, uh, it's been an exciting week. We had World Bee Day. We have, the weather's changing. Bees are coming and going. How, mostly how, going. How the bees? Mostly going. <laughs> it mis- most definitely is. I spotted my first bumblebee queens this week on, in Connecticut, where I currently am. Uh, it's been cool and windy, but they're out flying. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of, uh, well, we've had some really nice weather, and it's gotten really cool in the last couple of days, so things are kind of keeping close to home. What about you, Kim? You need any water? We had an <laughs> inch of rain yesterday, an inch. That's on top of the inch and a half for the last four days. So it's over two, 2. 2.27 inches, I think they told me. Uh, I, I, I can't walk in my yard. My hives are floating across the yard. It's it's just awful. I don't know what we're going to do. Your Your April showers are showing up in May. Yes, they are. And and what they're, you know, the, I'll tell you a sad picture. <clears throat> My red bud is in full bloom. We get an inch of rain and it's no longer bloom at all. It's all on the ground. Mm. I have a, a pink spot on my yard where that red bud was. <laughs> and that's usually, you know, a seven day, seven day, nine day bloom period. I, I don't think, I don't think. I don't think I make quite a super of honey off. I got five or six red buds in my yard, and I, don't, I probably make close to a super of honey spread out on all of my hives together on that bloom when it works. This year, squat. Yeah, all the cherry blossoms are on the ground here. So. Oh, how sad. Well, you guys, you know, I'm really feeling for you because, well, no, I'm not really. I, I know how you feel. Because the uh, that's the way it is. That's the way I've experienced spring in the Pacific Northwest. As soon as all the blooms come out, it rains for a week solid, and they end up on the ground. And the bees are just saying, "What the heck? What the heck?" Yep. yep. Um, has it been drier so, this year, or is it uh, has it been a wet spring for you? It's actually been a little bit dry. Uh, we had uh, two weeks of really warm weather in the 70s and, and, and it even hit 80 a couple times. And everyone was like, well, this is weird. But uh, it's gone back to gray and cloudy and, and it's low 60s now. So it's uh, the bees are getting out, but they're not out in force like they were two weeks ago. In fact, you know, the, the talk on the, uh, of bees, that's during that warm spell is when I had all those that one colony swarmed four times, and do you have any bees left in the so- box? <laughs> well, I told Kim. I told Kim there, there were a few playing parcheesi when I checked on them the last time. They they weren't doing a whole lot, and uh, but uh, there's no queen left now. They're they're queenless. So it's like, oh man, 
<laughs> it's frustrating. Yeah. No queens yeah, queen. and no no queen cells. No Nothing. queens, no queen Whoa. cells, no eggs. They just abandon ship. I they mean, swarm themselves away. Yeah, they they. I mean, they they just said, well, there's no one home. There's no one left. But they're still, you know, pulling and pollen and keeping the brood chamber warm. But there's really nothing there. So, I've been hearing from a lot that they're having queen issues this spring. Um, some of the nukes people are getting in are are turning up with laying workers and queenless packages. The queens are are taking off and leaving leaving the colony with just worker bees. So. Um, I, I, I hear a lot of people are struggling. I did the classic, which, how should I call this? The classic, uh, queen introduction, uh, mistake on one of mine. Uh, I, I don't let, uh, I block her off for a week and then I put in fondant and I let them release her. And when I went back after three days, they hadn't still hadn't released her. So I was going to pull the plug out. And of course there she went, she saw the sky and took <laughs> off. And, you know, what, what you have to do when that happens, well, what I've been taught you have to do is you leave the cover sideways so that she can find the colony older, but the colony isn't totally exposed. And I came back in two hours and there she was. Walking Seriously? On, walking on the top bar. So I got, I got lucky that time. Yeah, I've always, Very I've always nice. been told that you just stand still for about five to ten minutes. Usually she does an orientation circle and then comes right on back in um and she's she's now added you to the landscape so you're yep. part of the <laughs> part of the markings well you know that's a that's a good topic queens this uh the interview you have coming up for us uh tucka really talks about queens how do you how did you meet tucka and um why did you choose her for your interview uh, I met Tucka a few years back. I actually went down to Florida to work bees with her and Sam Comfort um, when they were running Anarchy Apiaries together. And watching Tucka work bees is just watching somebody in their element. She would s- scurry right on up a tree wearing nothing but boy shorts and a t-shirt up in the tree with swarms, banging them out, of, drumming them out. Um, you would see her spread a swarm on a blanket and she would spot that queen in absolutely no time. It was I was down there for three days and I had an absolute blast. She was keeping bees down in um, mango orchards, mango groves. And so you would stop and you could eat fruit right off the trees as well. Um, it was a very different <laughs> way of keeping bees. All of her bees uh, that they were running at the time were in these handmade boxes out of just regular lumber that you can pick up at Home Depot. Uh, They don't use frames. They just use bamboo skewers and they let the bees draw a wild comb. But what's really interesting with Tucka is she then went and worked with Michael Palmer up in Vermont, um, who runs a sustainable commercial apiary, all deeps, all normal standard Langstroth equipment, 700, 800 hives. And she's pulling honey with the best of them, making sure all the colonies are queen right and doing a lot of his grafting for him as well. So she's just she she spans that whole world from treatment free to sustainable commercial beekeeping, and she integrates techniques from both of that into her own operation. So she's just always a hoot to talk to. She has really interesting perspectives. Well, let's uh, get into it now and and uh, listen to the interview. Hi, Tucker. Uh, so so pleased you could join us today. And you run bees both in Florida and upstate New York. Can you I tell do- us a little? Can you tell us a little bit about how you first got involved with bees and beekeeping? Yeah, so it was um, May of 2013, and I was over in Europe, and I was doing a little bit of, you know, learning about different ways to run organic farms. Uh, I've been farming for about 10 years on and off, mostly just do, coming in for harvest or planting or big jobs, you know, up kind of up and down the East Coast of the States. Uh, I decided I wanted to try something different. So I had an interest in bees, sheep or orchards. And the first thing that I found was bees. And that okay. was at the house of Heidi Herman, in about an hour south of London, the Natural Beekeeping Trust. Very, very interesting. And so did you did you continue with your love of sheep at all or has that completely fallen by the wayside? Well, the sheep were kind of like a childhood story for me a little bit because my uncle was a sheep farmer in Tasmania, Australia when I was little. And I don't have a lot of memories of that, but they were really sweet and lovely. 
However, I did not find that my love for sheep became a driving force in my life. Okay, fair enough. So you you started in beekeeping with this natural beekeeping attitude. And then later you also worked for commercial beekeeper Michael Palmer up in Vermont. Can you describe how these two different approaches to beekeeping have influenced your own way of keeping hives? Only if you have like, you know, three or four days to listen. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I can, I can say a little bit about it. So uh, the experience that I had with the Natural Beekeeping Trust and specifically with with Heidi Herman was one of very profound magic and romance. I, I really fell in love with the bees in a in a deep and powerful way, and it was a, a bit of a whirlwind for me. You know, I just like basically got caught up in a swarm and and uh, and carried off, essentially. Um, and <laughs> Working with Mike Palmer or other commercial beekeepers has been a a very different experience, but I have found, interestingly, that it's rooted in the very same thing, which is a profound fascination with and love for the bees. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's very much evident in the way that Mike Palmer runs his business and also in the way that he even physically works a colony um, and the way that he moves in the bee yard. Um, And Working there was was really amazing, especially because we had a community of people who would come. And so Mike has these queen catch days where, you know, I don't know, five to 20 people could show up. <laughs> in you, a never field kn- and- <laughs> you never know how many are going to be there. Yeah, you never know who you're going to get. And so that's another commonality is when there would be a swarm at Heidi Herman's place, uh, at all proceedings other than the swarm would stop and someone would get a white sheet and spread it on the lawn and someone would get a basket to catch the swarm and someone would make tea and then we would all just come together and watch the bees sometimes for hours into the afternoon. And the same thing sort of happens with Mike. I mean, yes, we're, we're producing queens on a commercial scale and somebody does have to go to the post office at the end of the day and actually ship and sell the queens. But essentially, it's just a coming together of, of bees and people. And I, I really love that I was able to find that same thread, even in such vastly different situations. Yeah, no, I definitely think there's there's definitely a community that builds around bees and working colonies. I have actually seen you work a swarm on a sheet, and you have this amazing ability to spot the queen pretty darn quickly. What are some of your tips for finding her amongst the mass of her colony? Gosh, practice a lot. (laughs) All the time. (laughs) Yeah. I was going to say, I think practice is one of the big things that a lot of hobby beekeepers don't get because they they don't have that access to many, many colonies. And so they don't have a repetition of task and it makes it much more difficult. I've seen you work bees. You have a very intuitive nature where you you sense the colony almost, I would say. Um, It's quite lovely, lovely to watch. Thank you. I really, I, I love them a lot, you know? So what, what you're seeing is just my actual relationship with them. And that's, and that's kind of what it, what my best advice is, is that when I'm in a colony for whatever reason, and I'm looking for something, I make sure that uh, someone once told me when I was a child about the, the scientific phenomenon that is the eidetic image. So when a predator is tracking prey, they have an image that's kind of like burned into their subconscious brain past the level of I'm looking for X, Y, Z. So if it's, say it's a, a cat hunting lizards, you know, they see, they'll, they'll, because of that attention that's focused in their brain, they're able to see those lizards more effectively than some other creature that wasn't focused on hunting lizards was. And I have that with queen bees because I just think about them all the time. I think about them, I touch them, I draw them, I watch them, I catch them, I put them in cages, I ship them all over the country, like, I just, you know, it's all about the queen bee. And so right. that's the thing, you know, that and watching their behavior in general. Mm-hmm. As a swarm, they're particularly easy to read because they're not on the combs. And so every bee is totally free to move in a way that essentially orients to the queen. Right. And so you'll see patterns in this in the spread of bees that are on the sheet or on the box or on your hand or wherever. And and you can read those patterns and and see where the queen is based on the attraction that the other bees are chemically experiencing towards her. Right. And what is the, yes, it does. It's also one of those really hard things to, I think for people to understand who haven't worked colonies continuously on a regular basis, just because um, 
it's it's the experience of mastery, right? It, for example, if you're learning dance or something and the instructor can explain something and you're trying to make it make sense in your own head, but the terminology they're using is currently slightly yeah. foreign to you. And it's that familiarity that builds over time that makes it much more easy to comprehend. I know you've also you've also spotted multiple queens in a swarm. So how many what's the max number of queens you've ever found in one swarm? <laughs> Um, I'm going to just back backtrack just for one second in response sure. to what you just said. And I would say that my advice for beginners is a find the level of protective gear that's comfortable for you. Right. Don't be afraid while working the colony or you won't be able to access the level of attention you need to pay to really see what's going on in front of you. It's like you're going through a looking glass and the world that you're able to see gets smaller and smaller and smaller and you start to notice more things, but you have to be at ease. Right. So, you know, Use small amounts of smoke, wear gear if you need to, like, don't be afraid to do that. And to answer your question about, about queens, the most that I found in a single conglomeration of bees, I think was a, either 11 or 14, but <laughs> that was a bit of a special circumstance <laughs> because when, when hauling bees commercially, one, a, a person who's a queen breeder will often find themselves in the position of having hundreds of very small colonies in their hot van. Right. And so when that happens and you arrive at a loading yard, even if you get to this yard and you unload the bees after dark mm -hmm. and then unplug them, sometimes the next day there's still a considerable amount of drift, which is when bees leave one colony and move to another colony for some mysterious and fascinating reason. Okay. Um, and in Florida, sometimes that also means that, you know, 11 or 14 of these mating nukes full of bees all fly into a tree together and just make a, make a you know, 12 pound <laughs> swarm hanging, hanging from a mango sort of thing. Cause Florida is just weird like that. Um, but in a normal, in a normal swarm, like a Northeastern, just a single swarm, a prime swarm generally has one queen. And right. then the subsequent swarms I've seen up to two or three virgins in one of yeah. those. That, that's that been my experience when I kept bees in Maryland is those after swarms, sometimes you will end up with two or three virgins in the same swarm. So I understand you split your beekeeping between Florida and upstate New York. Why these two very different locations? You know, I mean, if you haven't gotten the gist of this yet, I basically just follow my heart in life. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't really, I don't really select the things that, uh, that I currently have, um, going on by any sort of intellectual means other than possibly just the fact that I was born in Florida okay. and I, and I can't seem to leave because the bees are just, you know, dripping from the trees <laughs> in giant piles. <laughs> and that's hard to resist for a person like me who's so mad about bees. So there's that. And then there's also upstate New York, where I currently have bees, has a really amazing, beautiful, thriving community of young farmers who are engaged in different practices in regenerative agriculture. And they're really concerned with food sovereignty and bringing the right, you know, fresh grown food to the right people and building soil quality and community. And they are so innovative and full of life and passion. And they're such hard workers. And everyone's so engaged with the work that they're doing with the land that I really feel like I belong there because okay. I am so, you know, my beekeeping is not a job for me. It's my lifestyle. Right. And so being surrounded by other people who have their particular passions in that same way within the agricultural sphere makes for a really interesting, like, you know, brainstorming situation where we can talk about bigger issues in agriculture and, and society and, and really feel inspired by each other. Do you find that with those communities that there that it is predominantly younger farmers or do you find that there are some older farmers as well who have been doing similar things for many years or are reinventing themselves in the change in the face of changing climate? Mm -hmm. Absolutely and that it, I find both. And, uh, and I find that the younger generation of farmers is getting very creative to obtain loans and grants and funding and uh, in order to, uh, to get land to even do the work that they want to do. And then the people who already have the land are often entering into collaborations that require everyone to stretch their minds and bodies. And I've been really impressed by the, the progress that I see with that and by the way people are able to just be people together. Um, Fascinating. 
Yeah, up north there's a there's a bar called the Osable Brewing Company. And they are super awesome. Their property abuts the land that I own in the town of Keysville, New York. And uh, oftentimes I will not only see all of these different players and characters in the agricultural community, but I'll go there specifically to make connections with them. And okay. it's, it's kind of like a magic hat. You just you walk into the bar and you come out with someone to do X, Y, Z on your land. And it's the perfect fit. It's, it's really a nice so, thing. So it is a true watering hole. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so many beekeepers are trying to keep their bees more naturally. Can you talk a bit about your hive box design and, and the rough wood you use? Yeah, absolutely. So this box, sadly, I cannot claim the credit for being the genius who uh, concocted the situation. That, that credit belongs to Sam Comfort of Anarchy Apiaries. And he created a box based on the thoughts and concepts of Edward Bevan, okay. who kept bees. You know, you'd have to talk to Sam about all the details because sure. most people would probably recognize the most similar popularized box to Sam's being the Warre Hive. Uh, okay. Sam has some differing philosophical ideas about, about management of bees in his boxes that more closely reflect Bevan. Um, for me... I really love that they're made of rough cut lumber because I can just go to my buddy down at the sawmill with a jar of honey and, you know, a little bit of cash and get a pile of rough cut lumber and he'll cut them to size. He'll cut them down to six foot sections for me and make sure they're one inch by six inches. Um, and uh, I'm able to just build those boxes super quickly because I get a chop saw. I put a jig on it and then I, every, every cut is the same length and they're really easy to throw together with just one screw in each side so that when you stack the boxes on top of one another, if the ground is not completely flat, they'll actually self-correct okay. so that they're sealed and they, they move a little bit. You know, everything's kind of fluid and, and movement is allowed in the colony. I don't use any foundation, um, not wax or plastic. I let the bees draw combs off of uh, Sam's uh, forefront of beekeeping technology, the barbecue skewer. Uh, made out of bamboo. <laughs> Jumbo sized is very important. Um, he's been experimenting with using these boxes without bar rests, which is also a very interesting concept. And a, a towel, a heavy towel goes very nicely as an inner cover with that method. Okay. And, and with the ones that have bar rests, I really like the material Reflectex, which is like a shiny bubble wrap insulation material you can buy at a hardware store. Okay. Um, I'm going into a lot of details here, though. Maybe I should backpedal and answer more about kind of. No, no, that that's absolutely fine. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, <laughs> some listeners are trying to wrap their head around keeping <laughs> hives off of barbecue skewers, and I, I mean, obviously, you have to manipulate comb slightly differently than you would with a wood frame and foundation. You can't flip it the way you normally would. Um, what are some of the drawbacks potentially of a system that's obviously very low cost? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have heat concerns or? Um, you know, it's kind of still in the exploratory period. Uh, I'd say the closest thing, possibly more popular than the Warre Hive, although that is gaining in popularity, is the Tanzanian Top Bar Hive. So mm -hmm. anyone who's worked one of those knows what it's like to manipulate comb that is foundationless. Not only right. foundationless, but also frameless. Frameless. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who also has done a live bee removal will be automatically more skilled at working colonies that are, you know, built on raw comb. Um, as far as the challenges that I associate with the boxes, you know, the, uh, unless you're really cognizant of the existing structure within the colony of the brood nest being in the center and the nectar being on the outside and the pollen being between the two, and it, unless you really maintain the structural integrity of the brood nest with appropriate bee space in between the combs, which is essentially two bees riding piggyback on top of each other, in between the combs, enough room for that to happen, um, it can be difficult to get them to draw the comb straight. So right. if you learn to read the colony well and never separate the brood nest unless it's seasonally appropriate and uh, you know done with care, then you can get them to draw a comb straight and it can be very easy to work them. But if you're not comfortable with that, you might find that the next time you go to try to open your box, you simply can't. <laughs> <laughs> they have glued everything together. Yeah, it gets a little crazy in there, you know, but if you're on top of it and you're doing 
uh, especially queen breeding, the Sam's okay. Little Boxes are really, really a delight for that because he splits them in half and I also now split them in half. So there's four combs on each side and each side has an entrance and they stay very small and very easy, easy to work, very easy to manipulate. Um, um, probably very easy to find your queen as well. Indeed. It's really, it's kind of like working four-way 10 frame minis, okay. um, only without the wood that can so easily squash a queen. Right. Um, cause you know, if you hit her up against the side of the box with a piece of wood, it, it, it's, it's over. But if you do that with a piece of comb, she might be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, queens queens at times can be much more sensitive than than people realize. I have definitely done queen catches, and every once in a while, a queen will just, uh, I call it playing dead. She sort of yeah. rolls over, keels over, and you definitely think she's gone. Um, yeah. But if you let attendants sort of antenate her, usually she comes around within 10 to 15 seconds, although every once in a while, they do give you a bit more of a scare. I had one while I was teaching a class. She keeled over. I did not think she was coming back around, but I was like, oh, she'll be fine. Put her back in the nuke box, checked on her the next day, and she was up and running laying eggs. So she was fine. But uh, it's, Amazing. It's queen, I, I, I understand your love of queens. They are definitely, definitely uh, something, to, a joy to behold. I especially love marking them, which I know sounds very bizarre, but there's something about putting the perfect mark on a queen that just is very, very satisfying. So, Oh, it's a, it's a craft. It's a true craft. Better Bee is pleased to present the interviews by Kirsten Trainer. As a supplier to our nation's beekeepers for over 40 years, Better Bee provides the tools, equipment, and information you need to succeed. Through its many beekeeping employees, Better Bee serves you with solutions to your beekeeping challenges. That's why they can say with confidence that they are your partners in Better Beekeeping. Thanks to Better Bee for their informative catalog, website, supportive beekeeper education, and for sponsoring the series featuring Kirsten. Be sure to see the latest at betterbee.com. Um, you- okay, maybe just for one second. I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off, but I, we just nope. went pretty deep into a specific. Maybe I'll zoom out just for one second and say sure. that in general, the boxes, they swarm more because the, mm-hmm. the colony is smaller. And uh, I haven't seen any significant drawbacks with wintering in the north because of the fact that they are vertical. Although I do sometimes find that it's hard to get enough weight on them if right. you're in a very, very cold climate. Cold climate, yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, but that's also, I'm still very new to managing them in the extremely cold climate that I'm, that I'm currently leaving them in. And so I would say I have a lot to learn about that. But the most noticeable things are, are the increased swarming, which does lend itself to being a treatment-free beekeeper, as long as you're in an area where swarming is appropriate and you're cultivating good genetics. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, and the one thing I would say is, is if you are making a lot of your queen, if you're not grafting your queens, but selecting swarm cells, the one characteristic you're definitely selecting for is swarming behavior in your colonies. If all of your queens are made from swarm cells. Absolutely. And there are, and there are very conflicting ideas and opinions on that, for instance, between someone like the natural beekeeping trust versus someone like Mike Palmer or someone like Sam comfort kind of standing somewhere in between the two. Um, right. And also with his own independent ideas, there's, there's really, there's a lot of interesting ways to look at it. And I guess, you know, at the end of the day, we, it's the scientists who have mo- the most proof. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I think one of the, one of the big, I mean, obviously the brood break from a swarm can be very beneficial if you are treatment free. The one thing I think that is of growing concern is if those swarms become established in your area and are completely unmanaged, if they end up with high varroa mite loads and then they crash, are you then getting a, a second wave of invasion into your own colonies that you have been managing? And that yeah. that's very difficult to monitor and understand. It does seem that colonies are picking up mites, not so much from the collapsing colony drifting out, but more so from a strong hive going and robbing out a dying colony with a lot of varroa mites when um, there is a big nectar dearth in, in the late summer when a lot yeah. of these big colonies tend to crash. So, Absolutely. but yes, I, I think there's there's a wide spectrum on the range of beekeeping, and everybody needs to decide for themselves where they fit on that spectrum. And 
ideally still listen to other people's perspectives and see what you can learn from them. Um, often I find it gets somewhat politicized with everybody sort of entrenched and digging in with their own, their own way of doing it as the only way of doing it. But yeah. um, the, needs, the needs of backyard beekeepers are definitely different than the needs of large scale commercial beekeepers. So Yeah, I don't, I don't know any beekeepers who think that their way is the right way. <laughs> <laughs> You haven't you haven't talked to some that I've talked to then. <laughs> You've ventured online quite a bit, which I I assume is probably not your natural habitat. You strike me as somebody who likes to live their own life and not always put themselves out there, but you are attracting a lot of attention online. So what is the key to an engaging post? And also what are some of the drawbacks of being young, active, female, and on social media? Oh, am I drawing a lot of attention? I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are. I think you have some of the funniest posts going. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm being very falsely modest. Um, I did <laughs> intentionally get onto social media and uh, try very hard to attract a lot of attention. Um, and it's working great for me. I really, I really enjoy it. It's, it, it, is, it is true that it's not been historically my natural inclination Um, But I really love photography a lot more than I realized. And I really love recording videos of bees because it gives me an excuse to just sit there and stare at them, which I honestly don't have all that often now that I'm making money from bees. And I really miss that a lot. I miss that connection with the bees that I found back in England when I first fell in love with them, that very first swarm, like that sense of just magic where the world comes to a standstill and everything around you is kind of suspended in the air, like literally suspended in the air, just bees and bees and bees. I I miss being in that mind space. So, so the social media is a way for me to really kind of take people on a journey with me as I'm doing beekeeping and see the strange and quirky and interesting things that I see. Uh, I would assume that a lot of different people see it and glean different things from my social media presence because I don't really make an effort to explain all that much beginning beekeeping facts or, you know, techniques. I do, I do put up specifically technique oriented videos around building boxes and I'd like to start doing more for, uh, for instance, setting up cell builders and advanced queen rearing skills, but I need to acquire a GoPro or equivalent head mounted camera. (laughs) <laughs> so that I can do these videos <laughs> while actually without, doing what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. And, and I would do uh, voiceovers with the visual. So I would speak while recording with the camera and doing the task. And I think that that could be a really interesting thing for people because that's actually not something that's accessible to right. someone, even in person in the field, because they cannot be in the position I'm in at the same time that I am. So having that would, I think would really give a unique perspective on, on what I'm actually doing and seeing. It's like first person video games, you know? (laughs) Anyway, so I, I, I'm, again, I'm going off on a tangent here. I, I like the social media. I'm excited about it. I initially started doing it in order to attract attention, to get invited to do more speaking engagements. Okay. uh, Which is also something that I very much enjoy because it's a way to have an excuse to travel meet other Mm -hmm. beekeepers and their bees in different places in the country and the world and just learn more and participate in sharing the joy that is hanging out with bees. (laughs) Fair enough. Yes. And they're, they're often very engaging. I find that no matter where you go, when you meet beekeepers, they are often extraordinarily generous and very curious and want to know what you're doing differently. So I, I fully understand the, the, the desire to travel to, to meet beekeepers in remote places. So, yeah. But, and, Indeed, and, what, and we can, sorry, and we can do that by video too. That's kind of like the, the most lovely thing of yeah, all. Yeah, at the moment it's imp- is especially important. So what, what platforms are you most on? Uh, you're on Instagram under, what's your I'm handle on, Inst- on? I'm on Instagram at tucka.b. My name is spelled T-U-C-K-A and then it's dot B as in the word B. Okay. And that's Very nice. primarily, that's primarily my focus. I really have limited time. So even though I am posting daily, I, I can't really do more than one post. Sure. A day. And so I post to Instagram and it forwards to Facebook. Uh, I did recently add back a lot of the Facebook beekeeping groups that I had taken a break from. Uh, Cause I found that I was getting asked a lot of very detailed questions that required a great deal of my time. 
And my time has become a thing that I'm, I'm managing more and more effectively to run a successful business. And right. so I found that I, while I really for, appreciate and respect, for instance, Mike Palmer for all of the free education and just in, incredible generosity that he engages in on a daily basis with people, both in the yard and online, I'm not really in a position where I can do that for people right now right. because I'm trying to build my numbers. So I started charging for consultation over the phone. And I also would like, I'd like to create a kind of a bank of resources that are written and in photographs that's available online that I can simply refer people to Mm -hmm. so that they can then start in on studying for themselves. Because I don't know if I've learned anything about teaching people beekeeping, it's that people don't actually do that. The bees do. Right. Yeah, no, I always say that the bees are your best teachers so long as you're willing to listen. Um, and I, I understand that there's a lot of demands. People are hungry for information. And when they see you as somebody who is has more expertise than they, they often don't realize all the time and effort it has taken to, to construct that knowledge base. Um, and that you spending time educating them does take you away from the aspects of your business that you are building. And so it's, it's definitely a difficult balance. I mean, we would never ask our dentist for a free consultation, but somehow with beekeeping, we, we have no problem asking for information. So, uh, I uh, mean, but, I like, I like that about it. You know, I like yeah. that it's, it, it's really humanized in that way and that you don't have to be an Ivy league graduate or have a lot of right. money or have the right connections or anything. Like I, so much of what I do in beekeeping just comes from my heart and is about whether I enjoy, if I spe- enjoy spending a time with a person in the bee yard and they're attentive and considerate and engaged, it, you know, I don't feel the need to make money from that. I, sure. it's just, it's just, someone has a person needs to be really listening and really thinking for themselves and actively seeking out research to better educate themselves and, and searching for their own resources and references and, you know, things like that. No, I agree. The the more engaged they are and the, you feel it in their questions as well, right? There's more depth to them behind their questions. But, but speaking of free, let, let's go and talk about freebies. Okay. Um, I know that in Florida, you have gone out and hung up swarm traps. So what are your thoughts on catching swarms? And what do you do with those swarms once you have them? I love to catch swarms. It's so much fun. It's pretty much my favorite thing in beekeeping. Um, I've really become enamored with queen rearing just because of the, the technicalities of it and the details and the, the challenge of becoming very good at something. Um, but where my heart my heart is always going to be still in that swarm that took it and never gave it back. (laughs) So I love Florida and I love catching swarms in Florida. And I have recently begun changing my tactics. I used to just hang swarm traps uh, about a hundred and about a hundred and one of them, the same amount of acres that the, the pollinator sanctuary I'm hoping to create in upstate New York will is Um, I, I would put them anywhere basically along the side of the road in parks, just anywhere I could reasonably access, I would put up the swarm traps. Now I've, I've focused more on building social connections in the community. And this mm-hmm. has happened through directly through the social media. And because I really like people and I like being involved in the food community and in the agriculture community, and therefore I also get involved in the food service community, which right. brings me into social spheres such as bars and restaurants and other things like that. Um, and the idea of consuming local food and supporting local businesses and, and all of these connections have been really great. And so when I make a connection in any of those spheres, I'm able to ask that person if I can put up two swarm traps at their house. Oh, nice. And then they know if the swarm traps are full and I have spies all around the county who just call me up when there's a box full of bees and I've, I've cut out half my work because I don't have to drive around and check them. Okay, very nice. And you're giving them a more appreciation for nature because now they have a task that they feel very proud of doing, I'm sure. They must have yeah. amazing glee in their in their voices when they call you up and say the box has has residence. It's so exciting. It's like and they send me videos and they post them online and tag me. It's it's just a really fun way to kind of play and interact. And then sometimes they keep the bees and they decide okay. they want to be that's why I put up two, one for them and one for me. 
<laughs> smart, smart idea. And when, when you've actually captured them, do you then move them into your own box system? Do you keep the queen that you got with the swarm or do you tend to requeen? So I keep the queens, but I keep an eye on them mm-hmm. and I, and I don't sell them to other people. And I, if they're mean, I kill them okay. right away. Right. Um, but they're very useful because some of the swarm queens, while, while it's actually not encouraged by the state of Florida to ever let a swarm queen live, I do find that a lot of them, you know, sometimes you just don't have the time to do all of this stuff at once. Right. Um, and it, if you let them keep the swarm queen for a little while, they're able to much more quickly recover from the trauma of being removed from the box. So when you catch a swarm in a box, you have to either, you know, just drum, just take the bees out with a vacuum or by drumming the box or with smoke or however, and uh, install them into a new box. It may be as you could do it with them as a package so that you're not actually Mm -hmm. giving them any of the combs that they built in the swarm trap. Or you could physically cut the combs out of the swarm trap and attach them to frames or barbecue skewers or top bars as you pleased using rubber bands or zip ties or wire or pretty much anything you could find that you think might work. Um, But they recover faster either way with their own queen. Right. So I try to cage the queen and then wait until they have uh, eggs in the new colony to f- and, and are strong enough with enough food to survive without supplementary feeding before I consider requeening them. Okay. Yeah, I've so, tried other ways, but this really worked best for me. So when you say you cage the queen, but then you're waiting for eggs, are you caging her on comb or? Uh, either way. So I, yeah, essentially I'm always caging her on comb because if I go the package method mm-hmm. and I do the cutout and I melt down the wax and don't use any of it, I generally install them on one one comb or one frame of larva, open larva okay. and eggs, and one of nectar and pollen. And I'll take those frames from other colonies that need okay. to be put back or that I'm already splitting or something like that. And I'll put the queen in a JZBZ plastic queen cage with a with a with a sugar candy that the bees okay. can chew through in one to two days. And I'll and I'll so she's them. actually then released and then laying. Yeah. So she's then released and she's either released onto the comb that I have physically cut out from the original colony in the swarm trap, or she's released onto a comb of nectar and a comb of larva that I borrowed from another hive. Excellent. Um, If, if you had to choose a pollinator to be your avatar, which pollinator would you choose? (laughs) I was thinking about this one and I've heard it on other podcasts before. And I just like, gosh, it's so hard to choose. There's so many of them. They're amazing. Like, also, does it have to be an insect? Because hummingbirds are really, really cool. <laughs> I would agree with you. No, it doesn't have to be an insect. I said pollinator, so you can totally go with a hummingbird. Also, I really feel like I need to show some love to bats right now at this time mm-hmm. in the world because they're amazing, amazing creatures and just so cute and weird and beautiful and very important pollinators. They um, are. They just got a new quarter. The uh, uh, American Samoa. Yeah quarter yeah. has the fruit bat on it so i'm pretty know, excited I about that it. i saw a picture of it it's so cute i feel like i kind of have to go with that just because of the, the what's going on in the world right now but historically i probably would have gone with the metallic blue mason bees very cool so yeah. um so one final question any advice for the next generation wanting to get into bees and beekeeping uh i guess my most practical advice would be just make sure you want it and do that systematically. Read a book, find a mentor, volunteer with the mentor, put in the time, get stung in the face, get stung in the face again, get stung in the face like 30 more times, and then you might start to know whether or not you want to be- are for you. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I like that you said, go volunteer for your mentor, because I find that in a lot of beekeeping groups, you get paired with a mentor, but then you expect the mentor to come- and help you with your bees. And most beekeepers don't have the time for that. And they also don't know what they're getting into. So I always find you get much better success and learning when you go help the mentor with their bees, because they know what they're doing with their own hives. And then you can take that knowledge back into your own colonies. I completely agree. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tucka. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me and I wish you much success. Are you, you're in Florida and when are you headed up to New York? You know, I think I'm going to mostly stay in Florida this year because I found that over the past two years of building up my business by myself, 
when I'm also selling off queens to make money to support the business, I'm actually not, I haven't been able to grow to the number of colonies that I'd like to have for this business to be financially sustainable for me without traveling back and forth. Okay. Um, and I think I, I think the number is somewhere between three and 500 colonies. Mm -hmm. And I know I'll get to that number faster if I mostly stay in Florida. But I do plan to go up to New York and see the bees there and bring some more bees there and continue to build connections. Excellent. Uh, in that area. Yeah. So, well, very, very cool. We wish you much success with everything and keep, keep chasing those swarms. Thank you. I'm so excited to have talked with you here. This is awesome. Well, thanks, Kirsten. That was really good. You know... I, I would love to spend a day chasing queens with her. I, I, she just was a fountain of information. I think it would be a wonderful time. She's really keen on having people visit her in the bee yard. She's really a wonderful resource for working with both experienced and new beekeepers and, and helping to guide them along. She's also quite the Instagram sensation. It's really, she posts <laughs> hilarious videos all the time. She has one where she has a bee bikini um, that has way more likes than anybody should probably get for a bee photo. Um, but yeah, she, she is, she is a lot of fun. Now, if she gets into TikTok, that would be uh, something <laughs> different too. <laughs> she, she may, she, she may venture in she, there. She, she might be there already. <laughs> well, Kirsten, you did it. This was a, this was fun to listen to. This was really fun. Yeah. I did not really know. I, I know her from Instagram. Um, and having no idea who she was or, 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 the scope of her operation and you covered it pretty well the queens and the florida and and uh working with mike palmer up in vermont um you put sam comfort and mike palmer and her in the same bee yard and you've got you've got a um you've got a beekeeper who goes from a to z in terms of experiences and 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 uh ability but i gotta tell you the thing i like the best a question I would never have thought of asking anybody is what was, what is your favorite pollinator avatar? I, that, I, I gotta, I gotta remember, we, Jeff, we have to remember that question. Well, that's uh, Kirsten's. I'm not going to jump on that <laughs> one. <laughs> but a hummingbird. And, and I've, I've admired hummingbirds my whole life. I've had, I have hummingbird feeders and I like to watch the males back and forth and yeah. I like to, find the little nests and whatever, but to, to want to be a, a hummingbird pollinator, I thought was way cool. Bats came in second, but hummingbirds first. And um, so it isn't all honeybees out there. There's other things going on and we need to pay attention. So good question. Good answer. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. I, I, as you know, I admire all pollinators. I'm a huge fan. Um, honeybees were my gateway bug. And I've expanded beyond since. Uh, when I was in Arizona, I actually had a friend who studies hummingbirds. And she came because I lived on the edge of the desert because she was trying to trap females for an experiment, behavioral experiment she was doing. And she had spent eight hours in Tempe trying to trap hummingbirds and had not caught a single one. So she came to my property, which was about 40 minutes outside of the city. And in the first 40 minutes, she caught 12 hummingbirds. Um, unfortunately, nine of them were males, so she had to re release the males because she was only interested in the females. But she did let me hold one in my hand, and you can feel them vibrating. Their heartbeat is so rapid. And she had to feed them every 15 minutes. They, they pretty much run on such high energy metabolism that they need to constantly be feeding. And so when they don't have the floral resources, they really don't do very well. Wow. Long ago and far away, I was working uh, at the University of Wisconsin Research Station, and we were uh, measuring insect pests on, on uh, annual flowers for home gardeners. The extension person I was working with was working in home gardens. And every morning I would go out and I would, we had a row of, of uh, uh, annuals that was, I don't know, a quarter mile long. And every morning I'd go out and I'd sweep with a with a insect net that whole row and one of those mornings i caught a hummingbird and she just <laughs> <laughs> away she went my net just took off 
And <laughs> so, so I got her, I was able to bring her in and, and, and I held her like you did only I had the, the, I held her in the net and I held her like you did. And that the vibration was intense. It was, yeah. it was magic for a moment. And then I let her go, but yeah, I know that feeling. They are incredible birds. And you really, I'm, a, I'm surprised you were able to net one with a net. They're very, very hard to catch. They can pretty much stop on a dime and f- take off in the opposite direction. Yep. So usually they use trap feeders on them. <laughs> well, that was my experience with the hummingbird. This was fun. Um, I, I didn't know where, I know Sam Comfort and I know uh, Mike and now I know Tucka. So uh, I hope other people gain from some of this because there was a lot of good information here. Thanks a lot, Kirsten. What, who else do you have uh, lined up for us? The next person I'm speaking with is Megan Milbrath. And then after mm-hmm. that, Maddie Oswald, who did her undergrad with Tom Seeley and is now doing a PhD at Arizona State looking at carpenter bees. She has some fascinating stories. I worked with Megan on the, when I was with the magazine. She's, uh, she's a lot of fun and, and way smart. She is. We had a chance to really delve into fungicides and EFB. So it was a very interesting conversation. I look forward to it. Good. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of Beekeeping Today podcast. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their sponsorship of Beekeeping Today podcast. And we want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Well, Kim and Kirsten, anything else you want to add before we go away? Well, you're what we want to welcome Better Bee back. You know, they worked with us on our Beginners series, and they were here today. So uh, welcome aboard, Better Bee. Thank you. You bet. Yes, they're an awesome company. They really do put beekeepers first. Thanks a lot. We'll see you guys soon.